Thank you, Father, for the inspiring prayer that you are always there for us. Uh, thank you, John Zavitanas, who had the great idea of this boot camp and being the leader in our Exarch's appeal and enlightening everybody what the great need is that the order has in defending the Holy Mother Church and what we're up against, even more importantly. John really lets everyone know what the odds are, what the what uh, resources that we have to overcome uh, in terms of what the, I'm not gonna call them the opposition, but what we have to overcome. Uh, and, and Rocky and uh, the Chicago boys, John uh, Manos and Gus Publicus, Ste Stefan Georgeson is gonna talk about all the opportunities that we have for you to enlist, if you will, and show your offer of time, talent, and treasure, all three components. So without further ado, I salute John Zavitsanos and I thank him for what he has done for the order in mul multiple areas and arenas, and I yield the floor to you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, okay, a couple of things uh, before I get into the presentation. Number one, um, I, I, I see a number of you kind of looking down at your phone. So I'm gonna ask you right now, pull your phone out and download the Archon app. I mean, every single person should be doing that right now, okay? And you can set it up later, notifications and all that, but, but download it now so that you don't forget, please. Um, and, and later, if you can please set it up so that you do get the notifications, um, it's very important. Okay, um, second, um, I'm gonna ask, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna set the bar low and I'm gonna ask each and every one of you of the new Archons to please, if you keep a calendar on your phone or on your desktop or on your laptop, I want you to go in and set a recurring uh, uh, reminder every week for one hour, one hour for that week to dedicate it to Archon issues. Okay, that's a pretty low bar. Um, you, can, you can set it up early while you're drinking your cafe, um, but I'm gonna ask that everybody set one hour. Uh, do that on your phone. Now, why, are we do, why do I ask that? We started this meeting about 75 minutes ago. In those 75 minutes, 13 people have been killed for being Christian. Okay, now, now this is not an exaggeration. 13 people since we began this meeting have been killed somewhere in the world for being Christian. That's according to Oxford University at the Center for the Study of Global Christianity. Every six minutes, somebody that is Christian is killed somewhere in the world, usually in the Middle East, all right? Now, why is it uh, that what we are doing here is, is so important? Um, I think I'm gonna share the screen here. Let me see if I can do this. Give me one second. Okay. Um, all right. So let me, um, uh, let me give a little anecdote about how powerful the Turkish lobby and the Turkish sphere of influence is um, in the West. So about uh, three years ago, Kirk Kerkorian, and you may, you may recognize his name. He was the head of MGM Studios. He was the most powerful man in Hollywood. Uh, basically controlled everything that went to the, to the movie theaters across the country. Um, he, as he is dying, he, he, he's, he's Armenian, and he decides he's going to leave $60 million of his estate to uh, generate a movie concerning the Armenian genocide, okay? Because he was Armenian. So the movie gets made, um, and as is the case with most movies, you know, before they're released for wide publication, um, it, it got screened at one movie theater in Toronto. Now, what happened between the time that the uh, 
that this movie, which is called The Promise, by the way, in fact, that y'all ought to, if you can, rent it one night and watch it. But in between the time that the, that the movie The Promise began being filmed and the time it was shown at the Toronto Film Festival at this one theater, the Turks caught wind of it and they, <laughs> they decided to make a movie with the exact same storyline with a very similar title that had a completely different perspective where the villain in the movie was Armenian, okay? And it came out at the exact same time. Now, at the movie theater in Toronto, there were 200 people in attendance. The next, and it was the only place that it was shown. The next morning, almost 80,000 reviews with a one star, you know, like it's one to four stars on the, whatever the uh, Rotten Tomatoes or whatever. It got one star from 80, thousand people most of which came from turkey and guess what the movie bombed it was pulled after one week people couldn't tell which movie was the correct one okay so that's what we're facing now all right here's what i'm going to do i'm going to break this up into three parts i'm going to talk about first uh uh a little bit of a history of our church and not the, not the stuff we typically hear. This is a little more obscure. And my apologies, I was actually going to change this up this year, but I got, I got stuck out of town for two months. So I'm going to use the same presentation that I did last year. So for those of you that have seen this, my apologies. For those of you that have not seen it, okay, it'll be fresh. Okay, so here we go. So Let's go, let's begin here. So this is a very famous uh, life cover. And um, this is Archbishop Iacobus. Uh, this is in, this is March 26th, 1965, which of course is one day after the feast day of the Annunciation. Uh, now this was extremely controversial back in the day, right? He is, uh, the, the, the other white guy in this picture is a labor leader. His name is Walter Ruther. He was uh, the head of the AFL-CIO. And Archbishop Yakovos is there for the funeral of the Reverend James Reeb, who was murdered, a, a black guy. He was the only white cleric from any denomination to attend this funeral, right? And just to give you an idea of the, the context of it, I mean, it would be like, uh, it would be the equivalent of the archbishop today showing up to support uh, the young man in Wisconsin who was just exonerated for shooting people during the Black Lives Matter thing, okay? Just, and I'm not commenting whether that's right or wrong. I'm just talking about the amount of public backlash that existed at the time because that was the state of things at the time. Now, this is a really famous photo, but Let's go to something a little more obscure and let's talk about this guy here. Hey, John, excuse me for interrupting. I, I just want to bring to everyone's attention that in today's National Herald, that photo is part of a story um, written by Julian McBride, who is a forensic anthropologist uh, and, and journalist from New York. And is. It's just that it's so appropriate that you speak of it and opening up your presentation and it's in today's newspaper. It's a very important item that you opened up with. And again, it's something that will never be forgotten. Um, and it speaks about the Greek Orthodox Archbishop who stood with Dr. King. Forgive me, John. No, it's okay. So listen, our church, I mean, here's what uh, we don't realize. Our church was advancing civil rights before civil rights had a name. For example, this man here, Father Raphael, right? This guy was Jamaican. He stumbled onto orthodoxy by accident. He find, Now, this is in 1915, okay? 1915, he travels to Constantinople and he gets ordained there. Now that's before the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese even existed. And he gets put in charge of a Greek Orthodox parish in Philadelphia where Dr. Limbarakis is, okay? 
This is the first black cleric of a hierarchical church in the United States, 1915, okay? And, and now here's, here's how one man's efforts can affect others. His story inspired Patriarch McGuire of the African Orthodox Church, which moved into the Greek Orthodox Church based on this man's story, right? And yet he's kind of obscure. Nobody remembers him now, but he, he was responsible for thousands and thousands of people in Africa becoming part of the Greek Orthodox Church because his story inspired. Next, this man. This is ecumenical patriarch Joachim II. He was ecumenical patriarch for three years after which he was killed. This man, who is in Constantinople, under the rule of the Ottomans at the time, decided to write a position paper for a, a magazine in the United States called The Liberator. Now, 1860 is around the time of the United States Civil War, okay? When the majority view in the United States was pro-slavery at the time. Okay, the idea of anti-slavery or that blacks were equal was there was the minority view at the time. And he wrote a letter that appeared in the Liberator at a time when the South was winning the Civil War. If you remember at the beginning of the Civil War, the South was winning all the battles and it looked like they were going to win and it looked like they were going to break off. And this man had the courage to stand up for what was right at the time, right? I mean, and, and yet he's never spoken of, he's never mentioned in any kind of civil rights movement. He is halfway around the world, subjugated under the Turks at the time. And he spoke up because he recognized an injustice when he saw it. Okay, next, Bob Marley. Okay, okay, this guy, um, He's about weed, he's about feeling good, he's about doing what, what feels right. Well, guess what? He died as a Greek Orthodox Christian. He found Orthodoxy three years before his death. And his family and his producer and his agent went crazy over it. They attempted to talk him out of it. They didn't want the word getting out, right? But he died as an Orthodox Christian because he just stumbled onto the church. Nobody approached him, he just found it, okay? Next, okay, now, I want you all to study this picture for a second. That's the president of the United States uh, right before, uh, right after World War II. And I want you to look at how he is bowing his head to ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras. Now, Athenagoras, this man is one of the towering figures of the 20th century. I mean, really one of the towering figures of the 20th century. We read all about these things about Pope John Paul. You know, Athenagoras really belongs right next to him. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing about Athenagoras. Okay, December 8th, 1941. Right, that was just a few days ago that we uh, actually what two days ago. That's the day after Pearl Harbor. When Pearl Harbor happened, Athena Goris, who was Archbishop of the United States at the time, was so troubled by that. Now he's fifty-six years old at the time. He literally walked out of the offices of the Archdiocese in New York in his rasa, and walked down to the army enlistment office and tried to enlist as a private in the army uh, to fight for the United States and for the allied powers during World War II. Of course, they rejected him because he was too old. Now in 1947, he met with President Truman and he gave him uh, a piece 
of the true cross on which Christ was crucified. Okay, Truman was so moved by this. I mean, you see this picture and this appeared in Life Magazine and Truman caught enormous amounts of political flack because it looks like he's bowing his head, you know, at the time they said to a Muslim. I mean, he looks, you know, he looks foreign, right? So in 1948, a year after this picture was taken, and this goes to the power of planting seeds to protect us later. In 1948, one year after this picture was taken, right? There was enormous upheaval in Turkey. There was a, a civil war about to break out. And the Turks had a requirement that the ecumenical patriarch has to be a Turkish citizen in order to be ecumenical patriarch. And during this upheaval in Turkey, as is, as is always happens in Turkey, the easy thing to do is to blame the Ksenyi, blame the ecumenical patriarch, blame the Greek Orthodox Church. And, uh, the, and so the ecumenical patriarch is removed, it's vacant, and now we have a vacancy with the ecumenical patriarch. So what happens? President Truman, remembering this enormous gesture that he has a piece of the true cross, he ramrods the Turks into accepting Athenagoras as the ecumenical patriarch, even though Athenagoras was not a Turkish citizen at the time. Okay? And he flies Athenagoras over to Turkey on the airplane known as the Sacred Cow, which is the predecessor of Air Force One. And it is because of the president of the United States at that moment in time in the 40s that our church was able to survive without a vacancy at the head of the church, All right? Okay, let's keep going. All right, so we heard, uh, we heard a little bit about these resolutions that were passed in these states and these resolutions, um, so here is my, my dear friend, Ted Vlahos, uh, who's in North Florida. What we did was we went to the state legislature of every state in the country and asked them to pass a resolution recognizing religious freedom in Turkey. There was no criticism. There was no pointing fingers. It was aspirational. It did not ask for any money. It did not ask for any kind of commitment. It simply asked for a resolution that we have the right to exist that we have the right to practice our religion in Turkey and that we have the right to enjoy the same safeguards that exist here in the United States, okay? So here's a, here's a, sample, here's a sample of the letter, right? Um, and it's a very positive document, as you will see, right? And it doesn't condemn anything about nationality or anything like that. So um, one of the things that the archons do is we spend an enormous amount of time in Washington educating our legislators. Now, the problem is, uh, the, the problem is under the United States Constitution, our, uh, our representatives in Washington, they are up for re-election every two years. And here's what's going to happen. And, and again, I'm not, look, I'm a moderate. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I probably lean a little bit left a bunch of our folks lean a little bit right, but it doesn't really matter because every two years we get a brand new batch of congressmen and congresswomen that, are, that come in Washington. Now, what's going to happen, I suspect, if you believe the polls, is in uh, next year, there's going to be a whole bunch of new people in Congress. And guess what? They don't know bupkis about our issue, right? So we have to educate them. Now here is, uh, now this man, Ted Poe, I love this guy, he, he's a Republican, he's hard Republican, he's from Texas. He, he was a state criminal judge, by the way, and one of the things he would do is, like if you stole, uh, one, in addition to going to jail, he would make you wear a sandwich board and stand on a corner saying, I am a thief, right? And, uh, and I was convicted, uh, he, <laughs> pretty funny guy. Anyway, uh, some of the archons spent some time 
in talking to Congressman Poe about our issues. And man, he embraced it like a fish to water. Now here's the problem. He decided to retire. And so all of that institutional knowledge that existed with him now evaporated. He doesn't have any influence anymore. But you'll see the beautiful language. And if you've got your, by the way, if you've got your photographs on the computer right now and you can't see all of it, you can move it. But you'll see the beautiful language that he has about our church, okay? Now, uh, I want to talk about 2012 briefly. Um, there's a, there was a gentleman, and, and, and by the way, I've got uh, three archon, uh, three archons, new archons from Houston that I know very well, and they will know this name, uh, and that's David Dewhurst. David Dewhurst was the lieutenant governor uh, of the state of Texas, and there was, a, there was a state representative by the name of Joan Huffman. And we tried to get this state resolution passed in the state of Texas. And David Dewhurst, who's a, a good old boy, kind of Southern gentleman, uh, we met with him and you know he, he, we meet in his office, we explain the issues and he looks us in the eye and he goes, you have my solemn word these Muslims are not going to get away with it. We are going to get this resolution passed. So we're like, oh man, this is beautiful. We've got the, the Lieutenant governor, which in Texas is the most powerful position in the state because the Lieutenant governor is the one that sets the agenda. Our legislature only meets every two years. That's the guy that sets the agenda. All right. So we get his word that it's going to pass. Well, somehow the word gets out, right? Somehow the word gets out. And what happens? All of a sudden, there are over 100 volunteers on behalf of the Turkish government combing the halls of the state legislature in Texas. There are parties being thrown for the staffers. And I'm talking lavish parties, right? Because the staffers are the ones that do, do all the work. There are fully paid trips to Turkey, going over on Turkish airlines, first class seats, staying at the Four Seasons for a week, where 60, 60 of our state legislators were flown over to Turkey to, to see what a great government and what a great culture and what a great people the Turks are. Okay, all of this is happening under our noses. We don't know about it. We find out about it and I'm like, hey, it doesn't matter. David Dewhurst gave me his word in his office that this resolution is gonna pass. Okay, so what happens? Well, what happened was on the final day of the legislative session, uh, Joan Huffman, who was the sponsor of the bill, decides to pull the bill. Now, why did she pull the bill? because she is from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And who is, who is located in the Dallas-Fort Worth area? It's Lockheed Martin, who is a major defense contractor. For who? For the Turks. So Lockheed Martin basically told her and said, if you want our support, you're gonna pull this resolution. So she pulled the resolution. And guess who appeared on the steps of the state capitol announcing a resolution that was pro-Turkey, David Dewhurst, right? David Dewhurst. I mean, this was in the course, this was in the course of two months, two months that this happened, all right? Now, this is, uh, this is, in, this is in 2018. These are just law firms, okay? This is not what they spend. By all accounts, there are over $250 million a year that are poured into uh, uh, influencers, uh, endowed chairs of universities, uh, through these uh, shadowy foundations that, that have, have no indication that they are Turkish related. For example, there's an organization called the Pacifica Foundation. Now that sounds like some kind of liberal thing in California trying to save a bunch of whales, right? Nope, it is 100% pro-Turkey, okay? 
And, and the, the heads of these organizations are people like Don Smith, or, you know, it's, they're not Turkish names. I mean, they pay people to run these foundations that have uh, basically American sounding names. But this is just, um, this, these are just law firms that they paid in 2018 just for lobbying efforts, right? Now, okay, so is, does this work? Well, I'm gonna show you three examples and these are, uh, these are pretty, uh, pretty striking examples. And, and by the way, again, uh, I'm not, this is not pro-Democrat, it's not pro-Republican. I'm gonna pick on both here, all right? So let's start with this Gene Schmidt, okay? Okay, this is, uh, this is uh, kind of scumbag number one. So Gene Schmidt is a congressperson uh, from the state of Ohio who, um, who was, uh, you know, there was a, there was a major effort in Congress to have the Armenian genocide recognized, just recognized. We are talking about the death of a million and a half people in the course of two years. And the United States, from the time that that happened in the early 1900s, until just a couple of years ago, did not recognize the Armenian genocide. And so there was an effort, there's an effort made every congressional session to recognize the Armenian genocide. Well, this lady who had a very powerful position in Congress was one of the major opponents to the recognition of the Armenian genocide. So there is a gentleman in her district, Armenian, David Kerkorian, okay, you can tell the Armenian names, they always end in A-I-N, right? So David Kerkorian decides to run against her and his campaign ads are that this woman is in favor of genocide, right? So what does she do? She files a defamation lawsuit against him. Now, the problem is lawsuits cost money, right? And she's a public servant. She doesn't have a lot of money. Well, who paid for her lawyers? Well, it's the Turkish Coalition of America. They decide to fund the lawyers that are proceeding with this defamation case against David Kerkorian with the hope of just burying him in legal fees so that he will back down because that's what they do, right? And so um, we go on and the Federal Employment Commission ended up sanctioning the Turkish Coalition of America because they provided her $650,000 worth of legal fees to fund this defamation case against this guy, this Armenian, who all he wanted was recognition that his ancestors had been slaughtered by these butchers uh, in Turkey, right? And, and the TCA ended up getting sanctioned, getting slapped on the wrist, really, $25,000 fine, right? And by the way, a Congresswoman Schmidt was also fined. She was fined $2,500. Okay, next, this guy, Michael Flynn. This guy is a really, really bad guy, okay? So this guy served under two presidents. He served under both President Obama and President Trump. Now, follow this. He's being paid by the Turks under the table. $500,000, okay? While he is holding the position, an official position, okay, in the highest levels of our government, in between the time that President Obama is leaving office and President Trump is coming into office, okay? He is orchestrating things on behalf of the Turkish government he is orchestrating military decisions on behalf of the Turkish government. We had, we have always supported the Kurds. I mean, they're our brothers, okay, uh, to fight ISIS in Syria, okay? ISIS is, uh, their avowed enemy is the United States of America. 
And so instead of sending US troops into Syria, which would be met with great hostility by our press and by our public about why are we fighting there? What do we do? We decide to support the Kurds that they will lead the charge against ISIS. This guy uh, orders that, <laughs> that, that the, um, the ISIS, that the Kurd fighters be pulled back, okay? While he's in office. And of course he ended up getting convicted. He pled guilty. And I, and I think he was, he was pardoned by President Trump. I, I'm not talking about any of the other stuff. I'm talking about this guy was a puppet of the Turkish government. And this, this is unassailable. This is unassailable. Okay, but it gets even worse, okay? Because literally the Turks support child molesters. This guy, Dennis Hastert, this guy was the longest serving speaker of the House of Representatives in United States history, okay? He had a thing for, for young boys. And he, uh, all these charges are brought up concerning uh, these, these young boys that he had sexually accosted. And so what does he decide to do? He decides that he is going to try to buy their silence. But again, he's a public servant. He doesn't have the money. So who gave him the money to pay these young boys to be silent, not to bring these charges to light? Yep, it's the Turks. And what did the Turks get in exchange? What they got in exchange, Speaker of the House, the Armenian resolution never saw the floor, right? I mean, here it is, okay? I mean, you can't make this stuff up, right? Um, $500,000 they gave him, right? I, and you just think about this for a second. This guy is sexually assaulting young children and he's trying to pay them off when they get older. And the Turks are behind this and they see an opportunity, all right? Um, now, eventually, eventually this resolution recognizing the Armenian genocide, it passed but it took almost a hundred years. It took the efforts of thousands and thousands and thousands of people trying to push this. And look, there is a difference between somebody converting a building into a mosque versus murdering a million and a half people, okay? People don't get so excised about converting a building. They will get excised about a million and a half, uh, the murder of a million and a half people. That took a hundred years, a hundred years, right? So uh, this, is, uh, this is what I was talking about. <laughs> this is when uh, the, uh, what happened to us in Texas. And just take a moment to read that, okay? And, and look at this, the, uh, uh, they, Okay, so we're trying to pass the resolution on behalf of the ecumenical patriarchate, right? They get the, they get the, the opposite bill passed. And, uh, and, and you'll see that it says that the bill interfered with US Turkish foreign affairs, that it discriminates against Muslim, <laughs> Muslims, Jews, and Christians who are not Greek Orthodox and dangerously advocated against the secular democracy of Turkey. Advocating religious freedom, they interpreted that that was a threat to democracy in Turkey. I mean, this is the kind of, this is what we're dealing with on a daily basis, right? Um, and and here, here, let me just kind of blow it up a little bit more so y'all can see it. And you'll see that they, how do they refer to us? They refer to us as extremists. You see that? Extremists? These are Greek Americans from my parish here in Houston that are extremists, right? Um, <laughs> and this is the kind of stuff, this is the kind of stuff we're, uh, we're dealing with. You know, there's a, there's a concept uh, that, that I'm sure you all have heard called gaslighting, right? So gaslighting is if you just keep saying it over and over and over and over and over again, right? The, the lie becomes the truth and the truth becomes the lie, right? 
And when you are pouring $250 million a year into the US economy to reorient people on what is going on over there, okay, eventually it takes hold. However, however, because the archons are really extraordinary and they are the best of the best, we beat this back. We beat this back and how did we do it? We got, uh, we contacted every Orthodox church, not just Greek Orthodox, Orthodox church in the state of Texas. And we got over 8,000 letters. We had form letters sent that were mailed into Austin um, where we, they said they've never seen a response like this. And we got organized and we pushed and we got our resolution passed. And we also publicized we put, we put a bullseye on David Dewhurst and we got everybody to contribute to his opponent and he lost the election. Now, I don't know if we made a difference, but it, it's a little bit of vindication. Okay, so let me move on. Okay, so um, all right. Now I'm gonna pick on the Democrats here for a little bit. So Erdogan, um, he understands that he needs the support of uh, the U.S. public, or at least he needs to create confusion in, with, in the minds of the U.S. public. So what does he do? He meets with Ilhan Omar. That's the uh, congresswoman from Minnesota. You probably have seen her. Um, you know, I picked on the Republicans a little while ago. Now I'm going to pick on the Democrats. She's the woman that wears the, the headscarf. She's the first Muslim that has been elected to Congress, all right? And, the, and uh, some members of the press are portraying her as the victim of religious discrimination. Well, <laughs> she has met with Erdogan on several occasions. Foundations in the US that are tied to Erdogan have contributed heavily to her campaign. And he, Erdogan, encouraged Turks all over the world to send money to her campaign when she was running for Congress. And the money gets funneled through these US-based foundations. And guess what? She is one of the staunchest proponents on behalf of the Turkish government in Congress. Um, there is an organization called the, uh, the Turkish Coalition of America. And if you all have a pen, I want you to write this website down because this will give you a good laugh when you read what's on their website. It's tc-america.org. Let me say that again. tc-america.org. And, and what they say on their homepage is their purpose is to assure a realistic portrayal of Turkey in the media and the arts. Now, one of the things that they do is they sponsor the Turkish caucus on Capitol Hill. These are members of Congress that are asked to join this with these lavish parties for their staffers. They get trips and there are over 175 members of Congress that belong to the Turkish caucus. They have paid for over 200 trips of congressmen who have traveled to Turkey with their wives first class, and they don't just do this on Capitol Hill, just to give you an idea of how deep the penetration is. They paid for over, uh, historically over 40 people on the state legislature in Idaho, Idaho to go to Turkey, because you know, Idaho is a very important port and Idaho has a lot of trade with Turkey, right? I'm being facetious there, but they, I mean, this is how deep it is. And they do this with state legislators all throughout the country. All right. So Erdogan decides he needs more influence in the United States. So what does he do? He spends $120 million building a mosque. It's the largest mosque in the United States. And where is it located? It's 13 miles from Washington, D.C. And there it is. Okay, 13 miles from Washington, D.C. And in the United States, 
you know, unfortunately, our leaders in Washington, both Democrat and Republican, they are thirsty for one thing, one thing, a moderate Muslim, because they want to be able to say, because in the United States, we are a polytheistic uh, uh, society, and we believe that all religions are tolerant of one another. And so in, in, in Washington, you know, even President Bush after 9-11, he says Islam is a religion of peace, right? That's the narrative that every president, Democrat and Republican says. And the Turks historically have portrayed themselves as the moderate wing of the Islamic faith, right? So, so this, this, this was built here. Now, how do we, so Erdogan supports ISIS and how do we know that? Well, we saw the thing about Michael Flynn. We know that there were hundreds of ISIS fighters that were captured by the Kurds in Syria. Now, these are fighters whose mission is to kill Americans, right? That's the goal of ISIS, to bring down the West. So they're captured by the Kurds in Syria. And when they were captured, their official documents had Turkish exit stamps on them, meaning they were going in and out of Turkey officially, right? Second, 2016. WikiLeaks, right? That's that, that's that guy that is able to get all these emails. He's the guy that arguably affected the, the election with Hillary Clinton. So WikiLeaks, 58,000 emails get released, okay, between Erdogan's son-in-law, uh, Beirat Alba Arik, who helped ISIS sell oil stolen from the Syrians in Iraq, okay? to fund their efforts. This is Erdogan. This is, this is the ally of the United States. Third, Erdogan's daughter, the woman married to the guy I just mentioned, Sumeya. She sets up a hospital right inside the border of Syria and Turkey for the purpose of treating ISIS fighters. Okay? This is Turkey. This is the Turkish government. Now, um, here's a couple of interesting facts about Turkish culture. 40% of the people in Turkey believe it is appropriate to stone a woman to death for infidelity. One in five Turks in Turkey believes uh, it is appropriate to support ISIS. Erdogan just changed the curriculum in schools, changed all the textbooks in schools, uh, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But let me let me go on with this mosque here. So look at the, I mean, look at this thing. I mean, this is beautiful, right? Paid for 100% with Turkish money. And of course, there's the photo op. There's President Obama with Erdogan in D.C. opening up the mosque, right? Look at the interior of this thing. This is right outside of Washington, D.C., okay? All right, so, um, okay, so back to this foreign travel that I talked about. So uh, Congress ends up, you know, this ended up becoming a real problem. So Congress ends up banning foreign travel to other countries that is funded directly uh, by foreign governments. But there's always an exception, of course, right? So they create this exception called the Mutual Education Cultural Exchange Act. And what that says is you can go overseas and you can attend a foreign country as long as a nonprofit pays for it. And there, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these organizations across the country. I mean, there's, there's one called the Turquoise Council of America. And uh, Ted Poe, who, God bless him, man, this guy took the trip, but he stuck it to him anyways. They paid $25,000 for him and his wife to go to first class, to go to Turkey. And of course, while he was over there, he was mocking them. Now, most of them will not do that, right? Most of them are not going to do that. Most of them are going to go over there and they think it's a, you know, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. They get to stay at the four seasons and 
it, you know, that's what happens. I mean, here's, remember I talked about, uh, here's the, um, yeah, here it is. Here's the, here's the Turkish Coalition of America. And this is where they're funding these guys to go to Turkey. And look, look at the name of the, <laughs> look at the name of the head of the Turkish Organization of America, Lincoln McCurdy. I mean, it sounds like a character out of Leave it to Beaver, right? Um, and this is, uh, this is the guy who's the president of the, of the TCA, right? Um, so, all right. So then we see, oh, by the way, when they take a congressional trip to Turkey, it is required that the first place you go is to the tomb of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the, the, the founder of modern day Turkey. He is on every dollar bill, or excuse me, he's on every bill, every, every bill of currency in Turkey. He's in every classroom and it is criminal to criticize him. It is, it is a crime to speak negatively or to question that he is anything other than a near God in, in Turkish history. So who went there? Well, that's that Jean Schmidt. That's the woman that I mentioned earlier who received the money for the defamation case. In fact, when the Archons had an official delegation to Turkey, right? We were required to go to this man's grave, right? Uh, before they would meet with us, okay? So it's a mandatory visit. Uh, this is the woman that took the bribe that got in trouble, right? And I mean, here's, um, yeah, here's the, the talking about the 200 trips to Turkey. This is, uh, this is published in 2015. So it was in a seven year period, there were 200 trips, right? So what kind of information are the Turks putting out there? What, what are they, when they're, when they're sitting in their first class seats, uh, eat, you know, drinking uh, their best wine and eating their great food and, 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 a, and a, a member of the Turkish government is sitting there whispering in their ear the entire time. What are they telling them? Well, they're telling them stuff like this, okay? So this is put out by the Turkish Coalition of America. And this is talking about the Balkan Wars. Now, for those of you on the, for those of you on the Zoom link right now, I can assure you that your great grandfathers, if they were in Greece, fought in the Balkan Wars, okay? You are here because of them, right? And here, this is part of the stuff talking about how the Balkan Wars resulted in the exile of a million point five Muslims out of Greece, right? And during the Balkan Wars, I'm just going to read this, many groups suffered, but those who suffered most were the Muslims. We're talking about areas occupied by the Ottoman Turks for almost 600 years that tried to liberate themselves. And this is the way, this is the way that this is written, right? Especially the Turks, 27% of the Muslims of the conquered areas of the Ottoman Empire died as a result of these wars, the worst civilian mortality witnessed in any modern European war. And who is saying this? Uh, Another uh, Leave it to Beaver guy, Justin McCarthy, the professor of history at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. Now, why is that important? Because the Turkish government in setting up these foundations and has endowed dozens and dozens and dozens of chairs in academia across the country. Why is that important? Because most professors will not make tenure unless you get published and unless you can get funding. That's the way academia works. And so, so when you're desperate and you wanna make tenure and you wanna be a professor and you wanna stay at your university and the Turks know about it, guess what? They will dangle the money in front of you and they will endow a chair, but then you are required morally to basically advance their cause, right? Here's more. Armenia. This is put up by the Turkish coalition, right? Look at, look at all of the schools. Look, look at this. These are all Princeton, UMass, BU, Brandeis, 
uh, George Washington University. I mean, these are all endowed chairs, okay? Uh, including that Justin McCarthy, that's the guy we just looked at, right? This is blaming the Turks for the Armenian genocide. They're talking that, they're, that, the, that the Armenians were treasonous, revolutionaries, okay? That they brought about starvation on the Turks. We're talking about the death of a million five, okay? This is like blaming the Jews because the German prison guard broke his hand while he was punching the Jew in the face. Okay, that's, that's what we're talking about here. And this is the stuff they put out. This is the stuff that they whisper in the ears of our people in Congress over and over and over again. And they reload every time there's a reelection. They reload, okay? Because the Turks are better at one thing than any other country in the world and that is playing the long game, playing the long game, okay? So this is um, uh, the, the House, House Resolution 306, which uh, passed a, which was a resolution regarding religious freedom. And there is Justin McCarthy, or, hold on, this is, um, hold on, let me move on here. Yeah, this is just that the U.S. Um, is, supportive of human rights and religious freedom in Turkey. And look at this. They say, House Resolution 306 undermines the credibility of the United States as an impartial and fair defender of human rights and religious freedom. Now, that's what the resolution was about. You want to talk about gaslighting? I mean, it literally is the opposite of what, what they're saying. Okay? And there was no money spent, by the way. This is just an aspirational resolution. Okay, now here's something that's near and dear to, to many of you. Look at what they say about Greek Independence Day, okay? Greek Independence Day is the day that marks the beginning of the murder of 25 Ottoman Muslims. Now, these are Ottoman soldiers, mostly, that died during the Greek War of Independence, right? <laughs> I mean, look at what they're saying. It, it makes it sound like... <clears throat> um, when the European powers finally forced the Ottomans to create a Greek kingdom in the Morea, it was a Greek kingdom devoid of the Turks who had lived there for centuries, right? This is the Greek War of Independence, 1821, where we were enslaved for over 500 years. And this is, this is their spin, right? Okay, now, so um, when the Greek economy uh, uh, was in near collapse a few years ago, you know, the, uh, for those of you that get, uh, uh, that have access to the antenna uh, uh, channel on the DISH network, you know, you'll see that there's a lot of soap operas on that, uh, on that uh, channel. And uh, one of the popular soap operas during one of the summers was a, uh, was this, uh, soap opera that involved a Greek woman falling in love with a uh, with a Turkish man, right? And it was whatever. So it was very popular. It was uh, and it was the kind of the flavor of the month for that summer. Well, the the Turks did not miss an opportunity there. So um, they said they said that uh, that the Greeks were so fascinated with this show that the Greek government has started organizing trips to the island of Buyakata off the coast of Istanbul um, so that people could see the place where this thing was met and that Greeks now want to learn Turkish and they want to speak Turkish because they want to be Turks after this uh, soap opera, okay? I, I mean, I'm not making this stuff up, man. I mean, look at this, this is unbelievable. Some Greek magazines have started giving away CDs for intensive Turkish lessons. That's a blatant lie. I mean, no magazine was doing that, all right? But this is what they are telling people in Congress, the Turkish Coalition of America, the $250 million a year that's coming in, okay? I mean, this sounds, it sounds so ridiculous to us, right? Because, you know, from the time we were four years old, our parents made us wear the fustanella that we didn't want to wear, to say the Pima during Greek school. 
and it's just embedded in us what happened, right? But you know, the people in Congress, they did not grow up like that. And this is what they're being told. Okay, now, all right. So Erdogan comes to the United States. He comes to the United States, uh, I guess it was, and I've lost all sense of time here. I think it was four years ago. President Trump is in office. Erdogan is making an official visit. And there are a bunch of Americans, and I, I got to emphasize this, Americans, Americans, that decide to protest across the street. Now, they had gotten a permit. They had gotten a permit. They were not throwing anything. There was no, they did not initiate any violence. They had signs, protest signs, right? That right is embedded in all of us. And where were they protesting? They were protesting in the capital of our country, peacefully, across the street from Erdogan's hotel. Erdogan is surrounded by his bodyguards. When he saw the protest signs and they were yelling things about how he violated religious freedoms, okay, this is what happened. And I want you to pay close attention. These are Americans, these are Americans, okay? I want you to pay close attention to the guy on the ground. Turn up your sound. The following report contains some disturbing images. Okay, so again, those were Americans on the ground. The men in the black suits were Turkish bodyguards. Now, these assaults are happening, you saw this, right in front of the police, right in front of the police. And yet, nobody was arrested, nobody was hauled in. Instead, this is what happened. This is, <laughs> this is the official Turkish response to what you just saw. All right. They lodged a protest, calling it an act of aggression on the part of these peaceful protesters. I mean, I mean look at this. This is what was being put out in the Turkish newspapers in Turkey. Of course, the video you just saw is not available anywhere in Turkey. You cannot access that video on YouTube in Turkey. It gets even better. Now look, um, one thing, uh, and I'm not picking on him because I'm not, this is not political. But the one thing that all Republicans and all Democrats can resoundingly agree on is that, is that Donald Trump has never said the words, I'm sorry. But I guess he did, according to the Turks, <laughs> when this happened. Okay. I mean, this is a blatant lie. And this is what is being put out in the Turkish newspapers in Turkey that the president of the United States apologized for these protesters attacking his bodyguards. Okay. Now, 
I mean, that it, it's pretty funny. Now, let me switch gears here, and I'm sorry about the length, but this next part is even more chilling, actually. All right, so the coup in Turkey was attempted in 2016, right? And uh, what happened was a bunch of people in the military did not like the progressively pro-Islamic, pro-authoritarian, pro-dictatorial uh, progression that was happening under Erdogan, who's on the left here. And so they decided to stage a coup. Now, Erdogan knew about the coup before it happened, and he was ready. He was not at the presidential palace. Uh, he had other members of the military ready, and the coup was squashed in a matter of hours. How did he know about it? He knew about it because the Russians, who are experts at hacking emails, had intercepted those emails and had told Erdogan that the coup was coming. And so he was ready. And Russia and Turkey have a very, very unusual, unusual uh, relationship. Now, Putin sees himself as the next czar. Erdogan sees himself as the next sultan. And I'm not making this up. These are words that they have used. These are words that both of them have said. Erdogan laments the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And Putin's biggest regret is that the Soviet Union collapsed. Now, one of the ways that Putin figures he is going to prop up the authority and power of the Russian state is through the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, the problem with the Russian Orthodox Church is that although we are all autocephalous, there is only one church that is first among equals, and that's our church in Constantinople. So Putin's goal is to relocate the, uh, the primacy of the Orthodox world to Moscow, because Putin's view is that the title ecumenical patriarch does not go with the person, it goes with the place, okay? And so if we are extinguished in Constantinople, it doesn't matter if the ecumenical patriarch relocates to Athens or to Brussels or to New York or to London. He loses his authority, according to Putin, and it reverts to Moscow. Now, this is the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, right? And this man, um, very interesting background about this man. So what we know is between, um, Putin, uh, the, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, this man here, sits, on Putin's cabinet, all right? He sits on Putin's cabinet. Now, now, the next statistic I'm about to tell you is generally a good thing, but the motives behind it are not so good. Between 2009 and 2019, that is a 10 year period, Putin built 9,386 new churches in Russia. That's on average about one church a day. Everywhere where there is a Russian embassy, he builds a Russian Orthodox church right next to it, okay? And the thing about the Russian Orthodox church is the letter that is capitalized is not the O, it's the R. It's the Russian Orthodox church because the doctrines of the Russian Orthodox church from an ecclesiastical standpoint, they are identical to ours. But administratively, there is no Orthodox Church in Russia without the Russian state. They are inseparable, inseparable, right? So here's a little history. In the 30s, when the Soviet Union still existed, the Soviets, what was then the Soviet Union, killed tens of thousands of priests. Now, the Russian people are pretty devout people, and 
um, despite the murder of tens of thousands of Russian Orthodox priests, the Russian Orthodox Church continued to uh, exist underground, sort of like the Greek Orthodox Church did during uh, the Ottoman occupation, the underground churches. So the KGB, and Putin was KGB, the KGB came to realize that it is better to control the church than to try to eliminate the church. And so they took control of the church. The church, if you look at an organizational chart in the Soviet Union, the Russian Orthodox Church was, there was a line right under the KGB to the Russian Orthodox Church. The patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church reported to the head of the KGB, okay? And so this man, Kirill, the current patriarch of Russia, he graduated the seminary in 1970 during, while the Soviet Union was still in existence. And the KGB was fully infiltrated in the Russian Orthodox Church by that time. If you went to confession at a Russian Orthodox Church and you confessed to your father confessor that you had concerns about your freedoms <clears throat> or about somebody in the Communist Party, you got turned in. You got turned in, okay? And this man, Kirill, he rose up the ranks like a rocket. I mean, he started out as at the lowest level. And by the time he became a bishop, he was the only person in the Russian Orthodox Church that was allowed to travel abroad in the 1970s. And if you remember back then, travel to the Soviet Union was not allowed in or out. I mean, it was an iron curtain, but this guy could go in and out at will. Now, Putin was in the KGB. And he was put in charge when the Soviet Union collapsed, excuse me, when the Soviet Union collapsed, he was put in charge of the FSB, that's the successor to the KGB, after the fall of communism. And as soon as the collapse happened, <laughs> the grounds of the FSB, they, they put a Russian Orthodox Church on the grounds of the FSB Trading Academy. That would be like putting a, you know, a church, uh, a, a Catholic church in Quantico where the FBI trains, right? Now, Kirill is inseparable from Putin. They appear everywhere together. He has said uh, that Putin is a miracle from God he, in January of 2019, he thanked God and Putin for the Russian Orthodox Church and called the Russian government an equal partner to the Russian Orthodox Church. Putin uses the Russian Orthodox Church to highlight the division between Russia and the West. And this is one of the tools that he uses. And when we get to the Ukraine, the issue of the Ukraine, Putin has lamented, of course, the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. And he wants to be the Byzantine emperor. And he uses the Russian Orthodox Church uh, to control the part of the Ukraine that they invaded so that they could plant leaders loyal to Moscow. And so when Ukraine joined the European Union in 2014, of course, he viewed this as a direct threat to Russia, right? And, and that's when he invaded Crimea and killed over 12,000 Ukrainians. And the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, until uh, we took a very courageous step and gave them autocephaly, they were under the control of the Russian Orthodox Church since the 1600s, okay? Now, he believes that the ecumenical patriarch should be in Moscow, not Constantinople. Um, and they refuse to unconditionally accept us as the first among equals. When we, had the, when we had the ecumenical council in Crete, the, the Russians pulled out a week before in an effort to embarrass us, right? And 
Look at this. This is uh, Patriarch Kirill. The Russian church and the military are as a union of man and woman. Now, when our priests talk, we talk about the church being the bridegroom of Christ, right? This is how they refer to it. All right. Okay. Now, all right. So, okay. So, is, so what's up with Patriarch Kirill? Why is he doing this? Well, all right. I'm going to show you. Now, if, if, if for those of you that have been to the ecumenical patriarch in Constantinople, our patriarch basically sleeps in a room that looks like your children's dormitory. Okay. The church at the Fanar is smaller than our parish here in Houston. I'm talking about physically, right? I'm going to show you Patriarch Kirill's house, okay? The government spent $43.4 million building this. And this is his house. It's not the church's house. It's his house. Oh, I'm sorry. When I said that Putin views himself as a deity, look at the icon. That's Putin, right? This is put up by the Russian Orthodox Church. They've sainted him while he's alive. And the Russian soldiers, these are the ones in Crimea, are walking up and they're kissing the icon of Putin. All right. So that's his house. That's the patriarch's house right outside of Moscow. Seven acres. I mean, look at this thing. Okay, this is nicer than, I mean, this is, the only thing nicer than this is the presidential palace that Erdogan built in Turkey, all right? Now, how is it that the, uh, that the Russians, uh, what, what else are the Russians doing? Well, the other thing that the Russians are doing is, um, and this is not, uh, this is uncontroverted, they have hacked into emails of anybody they perceive as a threat. For example, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, okay? There's, a, there's an outfit called uh, Fuzzy Bear. That's a, that's a shadowy organization whose purpose is to infiltrate emails of enemies of Russia, right? They were, <clears throat> there was a special prosecutor appointed by the US government to look into this. And they broke into the, the, the emails of defense contractors, intelligence workers, and here's where they got real smart. They broke into the emails of the wives of military officers because they knew that the, you know, uh, it's called, uh, what is it, Kravato Murmuro? You know, they, these military officers tell their wives at night, you know, they share their day with them. And then the wives occasionally will chatter on their emails with their friends. And so the Russians broke into those emails and were getting information. And uh, the special counsel, Robert Mueller, he had indicted 12 Russian intelligence officers. Now, okay, so what does this have to do with you becoming an archon? I'm getting there. All right, so um, we know that Fuzzy Bear's aim is geopolitical disruption, right? And uh, they hacked into the French elections in 2016, the German parliament, the anti-doping agency for the Olympics so that they can find out when their athletes are gonna get tested, right? And their aim is to weaken those that stand in the way of the goals of the Russian state. And so they will create fake Facebook accounts, fake email accounts. Now, here we go. Look at this. This looks like an email from the director of communications at the Ecumenical Patriarch. Now that is his name, okay? That is his address. That is the correct date, right? And um, press the file attached, right? I mean, this looks totally legitimate. So you click on the file attached and what happens? Now the Russians are in. Nothing's bad is going to happen to your computer, but they have direct access to what is in your files. Now you're thinking, okay, well, that's in Turkey. Well, there is a very high probability that they have hacked into the Greek Orthodox Church, 
which contains the list servers of every parish in the country. I'm sure they've hacked into the archons. Your email is going to get hacked, almost certainly. Get some security software, by the way. That's an additional suggestion there, okay? And they're watching you. They're watching us. They're watching you, okay? They're watching the, the ecumenical patriarch. I mean, here's another one. Look at this. This is... Um, <laughs> This is an email from Google, right? Um, warning that your email was hacked and you need to reset your password. This looks completely legitimate, right? Nope, it's the Russians, okay? And um, this was sent to um, John Jillian's who's with, I think, the Orthodox Church of America. All right. See, reset the password. And when you do that, they've got access. So, look, uh, I now want you to pull out. Um, John, John, John yeah. uh, Spiros, just real quick. Uh, let's not forget that the uh, Turks have infiltrated the educational system here in the United States through charter schools. Yes, yes, that's a, that, that's, that's a, a whole, that, yeah, that's a that's, whole other time. That's a biggie. When you mentioned about whining and dining legislators in Texas Education Agency, absolutely. If you look at, pull up their website, you look at their board, their board members are com comprised of Turks, maybe one American uh, name, that's it. Uh, when they get their hands slapped for hiring Turkish teachers and discriminating against people here, that's all they get from the Texas Education Agency is a slap on the hand. But I thought I'd just introduce that before you go to the next uh, item, John. So my, my dear friend, Spiro Katechis, who's here in Houston, who actually runs uh, some of the best charter schools in the country. I mean, he is spot on. And that's, that's a whole other presentation. I've got a, I've got a one hour presentation on that. And it is, it, it, it's absolutely disturbing what the Turks have done in the United States. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of charter schools that are being funded by your tax dollars that appear as if they are American charter schools that are Turkish based. Okay. That's a topic for another day, but Spiro, you're spot on. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pull this out. Please pull this out. Everybody get this. Okay. All right, so let's talk about what's in here. All right, so the first thing that's in here I wanna talk about is this. Okay, so what you see here is uh, just open to the inside cover of this so you can see this. This was an abandoned church in Turkey that Dr. Stephen Yalorakis, who's an archon, who's a magnificent archon, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars refurbishing to the way it originally looked, okay? The forestry department of the Turkish government went in, now this is the government, these are not vandals. They did this. They, they brought people in and destroyed the church. And when an official protest was made about why did you do this? Now, remember, they're Muslims, okay? So put that in context with what I'm about to say. Their response was, we thought that was a pig farm, so we had to take it down a pig farm, pork, Muslims, right? That was the response. Dr. Yalorakis <clears throat> spent, I think close to a half a million dollars or something like that, redoing this. And this is what they did, okay? All right, now, next thing I want you to pull out is this. Okay, so here's what we've done. Um, We've got your names here and we've got your congressman and we've got your senator, okay? So 
during the one hour that you hopefully will set aside a week, maybe during one of those times, you can send them an email and it can be about anything. It can be about something like this. It could be about a year, Sophia. It could be about the fact that our seminary has been closed since 1970. It can be about the fact that the head of the Greek Orthodox Church in Constantinople has to be a Turkish citizen. It can be about the fact that Erdogan just revised the textbooks of school children, right? Where they now refer to anybody that's not Turkish in the textbooks as infidels. And I, I mean, the world is going to be a much more dangerous place in 20 or 30 years or 40 years when these children are grown adults. There is, uh, please write this down. There is a website. Uh, in fact, if you just Google it, it's impact dash S E. This is a study that was done by a group out of the United Kingdom and out of Israel that talks about the radical rewriting of textbooks for school children in Turkey, <clears throat> in Turkey. Okay. It's one thing to fight the government. It's another thing fighting 80 million people, right? And, and again, they're masters of the long game. Okay. So finally, we get to this. All right. We are the only organization in the world that is doing anything about what I just talked about and, and, and what Stefan talked about and what Rocky talked about and what Gus talked about. We're it. There is an Archon organization in Greece. They don't do very much. And in Europe, they don't do very much. I mean, that is an honorary title. I mean, if you, you know, if you want to brag about being an Archon and you want to wear your pin uh, uh, during uh, Good Friday and during the Anastasy service, you know, call them and join their ranks. Um, but that's not what we're about. We, it, the Turks are spending $250 million a year. The Russians, God knows how much they're spending. Okay. We operate on a budget of $1.1 million. And here's the thing. We don't get funding from anybody else. There's 700 of us. Some of the, uh, some of the archons who were made archons a while ago, they don't, they don't really give. Now, I am, I am, and I'm sorry, this is a strong word. I am expecting each and every one of you to sponsor at least one day. Now, that's $3,000. It's $250 a month. Our budget is $1.1 million. That's it, okay? $1.1 million to fight against the 250 million and the goodness knows how much uh, the Russians are spending, right? And we have to reload with every election cycle, not just at the national level, at the local level, right? All of these resolutions that we talked about across the 50 states, those were done years ago. Many of the people in those state House of Representatives have no idea that was passed, right? So we've got to re-educate them. Again, this is, this is like uh, ocean currents. They just never, it never stops. It never stops. And what we are trying to do is avoid the continued erosion. I mean, the, the Turks want us to die on the vine. That's the, the long game, long game. We were three quarters of a million people in Constantinople at the turn of the century. We're 2,500 today, all right? <clears throat> so it's up to you. And so please, I'm going to ask you, 
expect of you that you fill this out today. And listen, <clears throat> if you can put it on your credit card, it'll be $250 a month. That's probably what you pay for your cable bill. <clears throat> and there's nothing glorious about this. It pays for paper clips, <clears throat> postage, <clears throat> the salary of our people. Um, and we operate on a shoestring. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, sorry. So please do not put this off. And I know that there's a tendency <clears throat> with our local parishes to pledge very little. You should pledge more there as well. But I'm here to talk to you about this, okay? And it's not coming from anywhere else. It's up to us. And so, and it's not just this. I mean, we need all three T's. So please do this today. And I'm sorry I took as long as I did. I mean, there's there's so much more. I mean, I we, we literally could talk for hours and hours and hours about the travesties and the injustices that are going on there. I mean, he, look, look, this happened last week. <laughs> the, uh, the Attorney General of Turkey has indicted criminally a Greek newspaper because they wrote an op-ed piece criticizing the Turks over their policies of aggression in the Aegean regarding drilling rights. Now, now think about that. If anybody from this newspaper travels to Turkey, they will get convicted and they will get put in jail for exercising their rights as a journalist. Okay, I mean, this is it right here. I don't know if you can see that. I mean, this happened last week. So, all right, that, that's all I have. I don't know, Anthony, are you still on? Commander? Uh, John, he excused himself. He has a family. Okay. <laughs> anyway, let me see. I don't know if we have any questions. Um, okay, so, um, oh, okay, thank you. All right, now, uh, let me just say one last thing. Okay, so um, let's take baby steps in terms of how you start, all right? The easiest place to start is in your local parish. And here's why. So many of you have watched uh, in the past, you've watched uh, you know, the David Letterman show and he does, this, he does this bit where he sends somebody with a microphone and a camera out to the street corner <clears throat> and he asks them, <clears throat> who is the, what, what's the name of the vice president? Okay. And, you know, eight out of 10 people come up with something really funny. And it's not, it's not the vice president because they don't know. I will bet dollars to donuts that nine out of 10 people in your parish don't know the name of our ecumenical patriarch. Okay. So the easiest place to start is with our own people, because there is this attitude with our people that all I care about is my local parish. It's just the local parish. Well, you know, we, we are tentacles of the octopus. The head of the octopus is Constantinople. And if Constantinople goes down, guess what happens to our local parishes? And we are one church. I mean, the creed says we are one church, right? So we, step one is educating our own people. And for those of you that are new archons, I would say what you ought to devote yourself over the next year, that one hour, is pick random people in your community and educate them about what's going on. And work with your regional commander to do a 30-minute, 45-minute, one-hour presentation to your parish about these issues. And we have lots and lots and lots of PowerPoints that are available at your disposal, okay? I mean, we've... We've had many of these in Houston. I think we've done, I don't know, a dozen or so, okay? And I know other churches have done the same. And now we expect you to do that because you, you are the leadership of the church. 
I mean, this is the highest lay position you can have other than being a cleric. And it's a leadership position. And so you need to get out there and start with educating our people. And once you get your sea legs under you, then you can, you can branch out, right? If you have a Facebook account, um, I see my, you know, my friend uh, Elias is on here, right? Post something on Facebook once a month. And if you're too lazy to type it out, get on the Archon website, copy an article and just post it on your Facebook, okay? We have to keep the flame of truth going. All right, so that's all I've got. Please fill this out today. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, I'm happy to take them now uh, to, to me or any of the other presenters for that matter. And you, 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 can un, you, you can do it verbally. I don't, it's fine. I mean, you can unmute yourself if you want. Okay. Well, I think, um, I think we are done. So uh, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Um, uh, please don't, please don't. And I know we've got shopping and parties and stuff. Please do this today, please. Okay. Let, let's get these in before year end. Okay. Um, and by the way, the sponsors are listed in the magazine. That the sponsor is anybody that pledges 3000 or more. And we call it a sponsor because we took that 1.1 million budget and we divided it by 365 days because we operate 365 days. Um, and, uh, and so if you sponsor one day or more, you'll get recognized as a sponsor. 